Hello, my name is Robert Levine. I'm a senior editor with polyphonic.org, and I'm here with a gentleman I've known for a very long time, Brad Buckley. Brad has been a contrabassoonist in the St. Louis Symphony for many years, and I first got to know him through Ixam, where he was Ixam chair, and I was a baby delegate. Uh, I became his successor, and he became my mentor, and we are here to talk about Ixam and its history, and electronic media and some of its history too, which is an area that Brad is a known national expert in on the union side. So, start with uh, Ixam. When did you get involved? I first went to Ixam in 1975. As a delegate. As a delegate. And uh, was actually, it was in 1975 that they established the media committee, and I uh, that was actually all of 13 years after Exum had been founded, or 12, right? Right. Okay. right. And uh, I raised uh, or talked a lot about media at that conference. So they, you know, fo following the old uh, thing about whoever talks about it a lot, put them on the committee. Right. They, they put me on the media committee. Right. So I, I started as a member of the media committee and, and as a delegate in 1975. And then you became, at the time they had a system of regional vice chairs, right. or what did at they the, call it? At the time, uh, Exxon was organized with a chairman, a vice chairman, and a regional vice chairman, they were called, besides a secretary treasurer, a right. census or dean editor. Yeah, I subsequently became a regional vice chairman uh, for the southern region. St. Louis was in the southern region. And then uh, in 1980... I became vice chairman when Fred Zanone right. became chairman. Right. And in 1982, I decided I needed a break from it, so I, I uh, chose not to run again, although they asked me to stay on as chairman of the media committee. And I served in that uh, position till 1986. Uh, then I stepped, uh, you know, I stepped down from that in 1986. Then two years later, they asked me to uh, run for chairman, and I did, and I became chairman in, in uh, 1988, and I uh, was chairman until 1996. All right. But then you continued on the media committee. Then I continued on the right. media committee until uh, 2002. So essentially it was fairly close to almost continuous 27-year involvement. Correct. And, of course, you've come to the conference since then as the delegate. Correct. I've come to Ixam uh, a couple of times uh, since, uh, since I, yeah, as the delegate right, from St. Louis. So you've been coming for well more than probably close to two-thirds of Ixam's history. Correct. How has it changed? Well, the issues are different now than they were when, uh, when I first became involved in Ixam. The big issue then was uh, the 52-week season. Um, How many works just had it? Uh, you know, I can't remember, but it wasn't uh, wasn't the majority. Right. And and uh, uh, but everybody was trying to get to 52 weeks, and uh, you know there were a lot of issues about uh, pension. Well, all the orchestras had internal pension plans then. And uh, medical plans and and uh, work rules and yeah everybody was very consumed with uh, with those kinds of issues. Although Fred, when he was chairman, tried to pull the conference in a slightly different direction, and he was trying to have conferences that addressed uh, workplace issues rather than contractual work issues. Um, job satisfaction, you know, there were numbers that were starting to come out then that, that people were not terribly happy playing in symphony orchestras, and uh, why was that? So we were, uh, we were interested in looking at that. And besides that, of course, there was lots of media work going on. In 1980, we put together something called the Symphony AV Agreement, which was this enormously huge, complex agreement uh, it's probably the most was and still is the most complex agreement that the federation has, and that that was an enormous undertaking. We were bringing in musicians from both coasts, and it took us close to a year to bring that that uh, agreement to fruition. And that was actually the first day of an agreement, media agreement that was specifically symphonic. That was the first right. specific symphonic media agreement, and it was television. 
which everybody thought that television was going to be a big uh, thing for symphony orchestras. And cable. And, uh, yeah, right, cable. Right. And the, the agreement was very flexible. You could move from one media to the other uh, quickly without a whole lot of bureaucratic hassle. Um, and also it was the, one of the first agreements where there was direct revenue participation. It's the first federation agreement that had direct revenue participation rather than participation in a fund, which is, you know, are what the other uh, federation agreements were. But uh, the funny part was we would, uh, we would meet the managers the day before we had negotiations at the federation and negotiate the contract. And then we'd go to the Federation the next day, and the negotiations were set-piece battles. I think they began to catch on because Victor Fontealba was the president of the AF of M at the time. And one time he, lo he looked at Fred and he said, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you guys were negotiating this agreement before you ever got to these meetings. <laughs> well, he knew what was going on, but it was, it was fine with him. Right. And there were some funny times. There was one time when we walked in and said, look, this is what we need in this area. And they said, they'll never give that to you. And we'd, we'd reached agreement over the issues uh, the, the day, day before. before right. right. Yeah. So that was, a, that was a pretty interesting experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, the issues were, were different. They were, they were uh, simpler. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't worried about whether orchestras were going to, uh, you know, fall out of existence. Mm. Striking was, was a thing that most orchestras did most of the time. Uh, you know, going on strike, so uh, there was a lot of labor strife. Uh, it's a lot different than it is now. Who was the um, chair when you came in? When I came in, the chair was Irving Siegel, a viola okay. player from the Philly. from the Philadelphia right. Orchestra. And in later years, as Irving told me, he said, you know, I don't know how you do this job, because when I was chairman, he said, I could sit down at my kitchen table on Saturday morning and catch up on all the Ixon paperwork and things that he had to do. He said, now it looks like a full-time job. And I said, well, it, it is. It's evolved from what it was. To the extent you had a mentor, my impression watching you all the years, it was probably Fred. That is correct. Yeah, Fred was uh, definitely, uh, definitely a mentor. He was a very close friend. He and I worked uh, very closely together. And, and uh, I learned a lot from him. Fred has a, a very interesting way of looking at problems that what, what nobody I've I mean, ever met. What, I mean, what did you learn? What did you end up doing differently as a result of that? Well, a hard, I know it's a hard question to answer. But. Yeah. Well, what, what I did differently than Fred did was at the time that I took over as chairman, there was a lot of strife going on between the union and the orchestra. As Seattle left the union. It was that year. Yeah, fact, it was wasn't. that year, 19. As a matter of fact, I was elected chairman and, and immediately got on a plane and went to Seattle to try to keep them from leaving the union. And uh, we were not successful. I was there, Dennis Dreeth, the then president of the RMA, uh, Richard Totasak, international officer, who you know, well, Richard is with us anymore, but, uh, right. uh, you know, but I immediately, I was in Seattle for a week trying to keep them from leaving the union. And uh, we, you know, they left the union and, and the orchestras were, were pretty restive about, you know, the issues that caused uh, Seattle to leave the union. And we decided we had one of two things. We could either try to take Ixom in mass out of the AF of M or we could try to reform the AF of M and, and uh, uh, make it more uh, amenable to what our needs were. And I decided that taking the orchestras out of the AF of M was not a viable uh, option because, uh, first of all, we either had to all leave or all stay. Right. We couldn't be right. half one way and half. And there were too many orchestras that would not leave their home locals. So we went, uh, we went the route of trying to improve the AF of M. That was when I managed to meet, that was when I met Bill Rail. Uh, Bill was, uh, was one of the finest union organizers that I ever met. Um, you know, this, this guy was, uh, he was a living embodiment of trade unionism. And he uh, worked for years as an as uh, assistant director of organizing for the AF of LCIO in Washington, very important job. And he had retired at that time, but he was doing consulting work. And, he came in and consulted for us, and he did it for very little money. He just was fascinated. 
with uh, with uh, this group of symphony yeah. musicians, and it was Rail that that came up with something called the Rail Report, which which established the structure of the modern what I call the modern federation, where the AF of M was at that time divided into two parts: the Electronic Media Services Division and the Symphonic Services Division. And he created all of that structure, and we got it through the AF of M. They passed. Uh, they, the uh, board, uh, the Interna International Executive Board, agreed to uh, pass that report and implement it. And we also uh, made changes to Federation bylaws. We put the orchestra services program in so that if we ran into another circumstance where an orchestra and its union were fighting, the Federation could uh, take the orchestra away from the union uh, rather than, you know, nuke, as we call it, nuke the local or, you know, put them in trusteeship. It's always difficult for the Federation to do that, but if they could just remove the orchestra, then, you know, they could, uh, the idea was that they could give everybody a chance to cool down and, uh, you know, put the orchestra under Symphonic Services Division, which uh, people regarded uh, uh, much more favorably. That was Lude Waldeck was the head right, of Symphonic right. Services in those days. And of course, Lou had come out of the Symphonic world. Yes, and, well, and he came out of the Exxon world, too. He, right. he was... Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, he was, was a, a delegate. Uh, he right? was a delegate. New York City. New York City Ballet. Right. He's a tuba player. Yeah, tuba yeah. player, New York City Ballet. And uh, he decided uh, when there was a, when they decided to create the Symphonic Services Division and make it a presidential assistant, he was interested in the job. So Fred and I both uh, maneuvered to get him the job. I and mean, he was the logical contender. But, uh, uh, you know, so we did. I put all of my efforts that way rather than the way that Fred was, although I tried to do some of the things that uh, carry on some of the threads that he had established about workplace satisfaction. That was when I met Richard Hacker. Hackman. Hackman, excuse yeah, right. me. Yeah. Richard Hackman from yeah. uh, Harvard, who had done a bunch of studies, including some studies of symphony orchestras, including that very big one with the Berlin Philharmonic. That's right. Where he determined that musicians had lower job satisfaction than, uh, what was it, garbage men, I think. And uh, actually, it was. I think. I think the one I remember was federal prison guards. Federal prison guards. That's, right. that's it. it was, that's it. That's right. Actually, that's on for for those of you watching. That some of that material is on the polyphonic site in the Harmon Harmony archives. If you want to go take a look. Right. Well, Hackman was a real interesting guy. He was a trombone player, amateur trombone player. So he liked music quite a bit. And anyway, I brought him to some conferences. And one time, he came into a conference and he talked about. Uh, he talked about women in symphony orchestras, and I was like, uh, I don't know what's going to happen when he talks about this subject. You know, we may have a, a revolt on our hands, mm -hmm. but the, the women just absolutely loved what he had to say. It was a really, it was an evening session, and it went two hours over its appointed time, and and uh, you know that was one of those ones where it's lucky, it's better to be lucky than right. skillful. Right. Right. But uh, so I had Hackman talking about those kinds of issues. Plus, I was trying to reach out and get some rapprochement with, uh, with the League. Uh, in those days, it was called the American Symphony Orchestra League, not the League of American right. Symphonies or uh, the League of American Orchestras. League of American right. Orchestras, right. excuse me. But uh, I was trying to get some rapprochement going with, uh, with the League. And I was trying to get some, uh, 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 you know, I was trying to do some more of the work on job satisfaction. And, of course, at the same time, we were trying to uh, get the rail report passed by the Federation and then implemented because it took a lot to implement it. And uh, so it was a very busy time. And then, of course, there were media negotiations going on. And, and you know, those were, those were what I would call the happy times in media negotiations. It was real black and white, you know. It was the companies and us, and it was us against them, and we didn't, we didn't particularly use any cooperative methods of negotiating. We just went in and pounded the table and, and uh, generally roughed up the other side as hard as we could. So it, there was, that's how I differed from Fred in that I took my whole approach to the union. Um, you know, I went down that, that route. And then, of course, I left in 96, and... You know, you took over then, and and uh, you know the rest, as they say, is history. Right. What about the um, AFM presidents you dealt with? You dealt with. 
a the number president, directly. Yeah, I, I dealt with, actually, going back to 75, the first AFM president I ever saw was Herman Cannon. And I remember going to a media, national media negotiations in New York, and for some, somehow we managed to worm our way into those media negotiations because it was unheard of for player representatives to, <clears throat> to go to that federation was, negotiations. That's what used to be called phono labor, right? Right. Well, that, of course, really was the only, that was the big agreement. That was the big agreement, yeah, that involved right. us. We weren't involved in the motion picture uh, right. or uh, agreements, but uh, uh, the first AFM president I met was Herman Kennan. He basically instructed us to sit in the corner and be quiet. <laughs> so, of course, we didn't. We did sit in the corner, but we weren't quiet. And uh, then, uh, then uh, let's see, I'm trying to... Kennan died. Kennan right? died, and then the next guy, who I can't remember now, took over. Uh, and he didn't last very long either. Was and it then Davis, Victor, maybe? Davis, that was That's it. Right. That was it. It was Davis. And then he didn't last very long either. But then uh, Victor Fontealba took over. And, and uh, we, we, uh, we, got a, uh, we actually got a good relationship going with Fontealba, who could be very difficult. He was very autocratic. Um, but we got a good, good relationship going with him, and he, he trusted us that we weren't there to uh, leave the union. We were there to work with the union. So we actually uh, did... We actually got along with him quite well, and I remember in 1980 we invited him to an Ixom conference. That was unheard of. To usually, no union officers were invited to Ixom in the early days, and and he just loved it. I mean, people doted on him while he was there, <laughs> and he just couldn't get over it. You know, so he really enjoyed it, and and uh, uh, you know we had a very good relationship with him. Then in 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 '86. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, or yeah. 87 maybe. maybe. I think it was 87. I think you're right. It was 87. Um, they were very unhappy with Victor. There was a whole group there. Marty J. Martin Emerson, Marty Emerson, was, was very unhappy with Victor, and so was the uh, Recording Musicians Association. And they put together a, 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 a coalition and unseated Victor. And and uh, Marty was the president, but Marty was very unhappy with Ixom because uh, Ixom had sided with supporting Fonte Alba, which was not a smart thing to do. Usually you should try to keep neutral in those negotiations because you have to work with whoever right. is in there. I think that's been pretty much the policy ever since. Yeah, yeah it's pretty much. Or if you're going to do it, you have to do it real right. quietly. <laughs> you have to definitely follow right. uh, yeah. Machiavelli when you right. do that. But... Uh, uh, anyway, then I came back as chairman, and Marty reached out. He was mad at the chairman that I succeeded, Melanie Burrell. All right. But uh, he wasn't mad at me, and Marty and I established a, a decent relationship. And Marty loved Bill Rail, and Bill Rail was always in there talking to him when we brought Bill in as a consultant. So we were able to get things much more straightened out. And although Marty. Marty had a hard time accepting the fact that we would go in and rough up the recording uh, mm. association. <laughs> the Federation didn't like to mess them up, you know, because right. of the special payments right. fund. Right, right, right. But we could, we could have cared less about the special payments fund. We just wanted to rough them up. So we would, uh, we would go in and, and uh, rough them up in the negotiations, and, and uh, they, uh, they, they didn't like that. But they would just throw their hands up in the air and... That's all we would yeah. try to do is just keep the status quo. And uh, uh, then by the time I had left, then Mark Tully Masagli succeeded Martin Emerson. Right. And um, then Steve Young succeeded uh, Mark Tully Masagli. Who was actually a bassoonist. And a who was actually a bassoon right. player. He was, he was the president of the Boston local and a bassoon player. Actually, he was a woodwind doubler. He was a doggone mm. good uh, saxophone player. Uh, besides being a good bassoon player, and and uh, he, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, he played a lot of Broadway shows that came through Boston where he had to double. But uh, he was definitely there was a big battle about that getting him elected uh, president. But we managed to get him elected president, and and he was of course very uh, friendly to uh, you know to Ixon and to me. I mean, I had a very close personal relationship with Steve Dew. 
with uh, Steve, and, I, and to a certain extent I still do. I try to talk to him as right. much as I can. Right. But uh, uh, then I left, and then you came in, and you know the various right. presidents who right. came after right. that. Do you think, looking back, that the call you made back in the 80s to stay in and try to fix it was the right one? Yeah. I, I mean, whether we could fix it or not didn't matter. What mattered was that we knew that all of the orchestras would not leave the AF of M. The local, the 802 orchestras were not going to leave the AF of M. Uh, you know, there were, uh, the Chicago Orchestra was not going to leave the AF of M. The LA Philharmonic was not going to leave the AF of M. I mean, just to, to quote a few orchestras. Right. And there were many others. Right. And, you know, the, 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 the rule was if you can't get them all to leave, you can't have them split up because then we'll get played against each other just like they were doing with uh, Seattle, you know, and trying to play Seattle off against the union orchestras, uh, the management's. Uh, so so uh, it was the only, it was, the, it, it was not only the wisest course, it was the only course. Unless all of them had been willing to leave, there was, there was no way that you could, you, could, uh, you could try to leave the orchestra. But that didn't mean that we couldn't... Uh, run a little smoke and mirrors on the air. Mm -hmm. The same question slightly differently. Over the course of your involvement, do you think the trajectory of union, AFM, Ixam relationships has improved? Has it gone the right way overall? It has its ups and its downs. Um, you know, it's not, it's not as... Uh, well, it has its ups and its downs. And I, I think the current Ixam chair, you know, tries to stay with, on good relations with the AF of M, which I think is the right policy. And I don't think that the current Federation president is anti Ixam, but he's, he's much more, imp he has a, a, a vision that's slightly different, I think, than other AF of M presidents with, um, and, uh, I think sometimes that makes for difficulties, but from what I can tell, you know the current uh, the current uh, Exxon leadership is able to uh, to maintain a decent relationship with him, working relationship with yeah. him, and of course we've got you know symphonic services. It's big now. It's yeah much well, bigger than it was in the past. Well, it was. It, it is smaller than it was actually when you were. Sure. Well, yeah. It has shrunk some. Yeah, it has shrunk some, but it you know at least it's uh, there and. You know, and it does a lot of really good work. Um, uh, you know, and at least we have our own, you know, division like that. And actually, many of the, or you know, many of the orchestras have, uh, get along with their local. I mean, they've taken over their local. Right. Unions. Well, yeah. Milwaukee, I mean. <laughs> right, and, sure. I mean, actually, it was, it was interesting at the Ixom conference. I, we had a discussion of this, and I said, I think there are four Ixom orchestras that the president of the locals in, the orchestra. Well, it turned out it was actually six or seven plus yeah. a few other yep. key local officers. It, it surprised me. Oh yeah. And I thought I was on top of it. Oh know, yeah. No, no. It's myself. it's. Uh, and actually, you were once, weren't you? I, mean, I you once. Were... Yeah, I was vice president of local two in St. Louis right. for uh, four years. And and uh, uh, yeah, when we when we did the whole restructuring of the federation, you know, we 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 pushed that people should become involved with their local unions and they should run for office. And that especially in the medium and small locals, if they would organize properly, it would not be difficult to get elected. Right. And, you know, so that was, we pushed that real hard, and it came to fruition. Um, you know, I can remember uh, going to uh, Federation uh, conventions and, and, uh, in the early years, and it would just be me and the Ixon people that I brought with me, and then by the time I had left, it was me and a bunch of local officers who were also Ixom mm. uh, 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 orchestra personnel, and in some cases Ixom officers. Uh, Dave Angus, you know, was one. I mean, right. he was the right. president of Ixom, but he was also the president of the Rochester local. And still is. And That's still right. is. That's right. So it, it, uh, it uh, you know, it, it had changed rather radically. You know, it was kind of like the inmates taking over the asylum. Mm. So yeah, I've, we've seen some big changes. Uh, you know, it. it uh, the problem is when I became involved with Ixom in 1975, the membership of the federation was over 300,000. You know, now the membership of the federation 
a real count, not the count that they like to use, where they count people two and three times. Right. Uh, but a real count would probably show that the Federation is down to 50,000, 60,000 members, I've maybe heard, less. I've heard, yeah, some, somewhere between that and 70, right. but probably no more than that. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and uh, as you know, the overwhelming majority of those are part-time players. Uh, Although, of course, you know, back when you were, I mean, the, it was a much higher majority because the people that left were the part-time players, not the symphonic players, not the full-time music. Well, players. a lot of those people were full-time players. I mean, what happened... Even the 300,000? Yeah, so, really. yeah, sure. They were all playing bar mitzvahs and, and weddings. And, and uh, you know, what caused the Federation to lose memberships was they lost that big lawsuit with the booking agencies yeah. where the booking agencies were requiring the musicians to join the union. And then they got tired of it, and they took the AF of M to court and won. And once they would not require those people to join the union, they didn't join the union because they said, why should I join the union? The booking agent takes care of me. Right. So, uh, you know, you could. I made a graph up of that. When I was chairman in, 90, in um, 92, I think it was 92, I had to make a point to the, to the AF of M convention and I made a graph, and it was a graph, and it, and it was startling. You, I mean, the way you could watch right. the drop in membership even right. then. Right. So, you know, it's going to be, uh, uh, it's, it's really turning into a union of haves and have-nots, and that's going to tear the union apart. Yeah. As I indicated earlier, I think Brad is probably the person on the union side with the longest history with symphonic media negotiations going back to, as you said, 75, right. and being part of AV. And in fact, the last major negotiation you did was in 2001, 2002. It was a right. revision of AV. Well, yeah, it was a revision. Yeah, that's right. It was a re revision of AV because that was after the uh, internet. internet agreement. But right. you know, between those two, you had many phono labor negotiations right. and, of course, the internet agreement, which we worked on in 99. Right. Um, the symphonic media business changed pretty radically in that time frame. Yes, it did. A lot of which I learned about from you, but why don't you describe that? Yeah, well, okay. It, uh, you know, the symphonic media business was never all in, you know, never huge in the United States. It, it was big in a few areas. Um, you know, for years, Philadelphia basically ran the orchestra off of record royalties. A lot of people don't know that. And, you know, so it made our job, uh, you know, pretty easy. All we had to do was go in and represent what our player, you know, what the players wanted and just pretty much preserve the status quo and make it possible for people to record. Uh, as, as you know, also in that time, the media uh, guarantee really took off. So orchestras were established. If I recall correctly, that was an invention of, of someone in St. Louis, was it not? Or? Well, <laughs> yeah, I wrote the first, I probably wrote the first media guarantee. Right. Although the idea of a guarantee was actually invented by the Philadelphia Orchestra back in the 50s, interestingly wow. enough. Yeah, they were, at that time, the Philadelphia Orchestra did an enormous amount of recording. And, and, and they, got, they got pretty unhappy because they would go in and play a concert on Saturday night, and then on Sunday they'd record whatever they played on Saturday night, but with only three fourths of the orchestra, and not uh, including all the people at Ormond who didn't happen to <coughs> like that week. Of and no, uh, right. oh, of course not, not yeah. including uh, you know. So it was uh, the favored few got to do the recording on Sunday, which is where the money was, and and you know in those days I think the Philadelphia Orchestra made sixty dollars a week was what they were paid. And, and uh, uh, so they got a little uh, miffed about that. Plus, you had then the tuba player and other people right. like that who weren't always used on the recording sessions. So they went in and demanded a recording uh, guarantee because they wanted it so that everybody could get a taste of the recording money. And, and they were actually the first ones to do a recording uh, guarantee and they demanded it. It wasn't the management. That was a switch from what happened then 20 years later right. when managements were demanding media guarantees. But yeah, in the early 70s, um, uh, we, uh, the manager of the St. Louis Orchestra knew that he needed, I love these figures when I think about them, 
He needed to increase our pay twenty dollars a year, not fifteen. <laughs> so it was twenty dollars a, a week. week right. Yeah, right. twenty dollars a week, not fifteen a week, but for each year of the contract. Right. And he couldn't get the board to come up with that enormous sum of money. So what the way he did it was he said, Look, how about if I give if you give me the extra five bucks, I'll I'll give it to the orchestra in the form of a of a recording guarantee and we can get something for it. So he, that's how he talked him into coming up with the additional five bucks, which was necessary to solve the contract. And so essentially was, it was an invention of joint invention of you and Peter Pastrash. Correct. <laughs> correct. And and uh, 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 you know and he he had to do that because he knew that we would go on strike. You know, between nineteen sixty six and nineteen seventy eight there were, uh, let's see, I think there were six contract negotiations, and we struck on five of them. <laughs> the only reason we didn't strike on the six is because of the Nixon wage price controls. You couldn't oh, strike. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, we would go on strike every negotiation. Mm -hmm. So uh, he knew he had to have that $5. So he did it as a recording guarantee, and I suggested, I said, well, why don't we just do it as a media guarantee? You never can tell. We might get some television. Or something. So you know, we did we did do that, and uh, but we were, to the best of my knowledge, we were the first orchestra, especially in our tier, you know, to do that. Because the other orchestras like Chicago were resistant of guarantees; they didn't want guarantees. Just Philadelphia, and uh, but uh, so we did that. But I can remember when when. I can remember when the price, the price of a three-hour session went to $100 for a three-hour session. And the English were like rejoicing because they figured that they'd get all kinds of recording work because we were pricing ourselves out of the market. And the cry in those days was, well, they live in England and we live in the United States. And, and in those days, the dollar was very, very strong. Right. So, you know, it, it actually... Uh, uh, you know, cost more to live in the United States than it did in England. Right. It's the reverse now, of course. Right. But uh, so there were all those reasons for that. But uh, so we, you know, we did that, and and uh, 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 you know that seemed to calm things down. People who wanted to record instituted media guarantees, except the very biggest, best-funded orchestras, who you know insisted on being paid for them. And by 1990, then, then, then in, in the late 80s, the technology change happened when we switched over from LPs to CDs, and the recording companies went crazy. They were re-recording the entire literature. So, I mean, orchestras were recording like mad. I mean, I, before I came on this trip, because I knew we were going to talk about this, I got, for some reason, I saved my pension payments going back to 1975. And I looked at my pension payment for 1990, which would have been the height of the CD craze, and my wages for recording were $10,000. Wow. That was a lot of money in 1990. But, I mean, we were doing an enormous amount of recording, way over our guarantee. Right. Um, but that's how much the, the companies were recording then. But then, of course, the, the boom busted, and then nobody wanted to record anything. They... And, you know, we discovered that uh, with digital technology, once you recorded something, it was good forever. Yeah. And all they had to do was, you know, reformat it and release it in a new format. One of the big mistakes looking back that we all did was not, we sold our rights, you know, for, for the upfront money, and we should not have done that. We should have kept our rights like our agreements are written now. Right. Well, that was, in fact, what I remember learning from you was just that whole thing about how the recording company's interests were not ours. And Correct. we were, I think you described it as our artistic history, our artistic legacy was right. being sold off and we didn't control it. That's right. I remember you had a story about, was it the Philadelphia Orchestra had gone to Europe and complained that their discs were not on? Right. Tell that story. Well, no, it was they, they. They went and the recording company. They they were trying to get the recording companies to set up at their concert venue sites and sell recordings like any garage rock band knows to do. And but EMI couldn't figure out how to do that, and so they rained all over EMI. So EMI finally said, "Okay, okay." And they showed up in England, 
but the recordings they were selling weren't recordings of the Philadelphia <laughs> Orchestra. They were recordings of the London <laughs> Symphony, which made the Philadelphia Orchestra even right. madder. But EMI didn't care. No. They, they were EMI recordings. Right. They, they were, were EMI them. recordings. They could have cared less. So, you know, we should not have done that. We should have maintained control. Uh, so how did you, as chair of the media committee, how did you begin to engineer the change? Well, I knew that, we, that there was no way that we could save CD recordings. I mean, first of all, CD recordings, you know, just dropped off the map. And all of that had been done. And there, but I went, you know what? For stuff that we do on Internet, and from now on, we can, we can, it is a valid trade-off to trade off upfront money for ownership and control, or control especially, if not ownership. And, and uh, that's, that's what we started to do. It was already being done to a certain extent in the AV agreement, but it was, it was as you know, then you negotiated that, we, the two of us negotiated that agreement together. Uh, the Internet agreement was the first agreement where we really had a lot of control. We were not giving away the control of our product. The most we could do was license it for a certain period right. of time. Right. And in fact, I mean, you'll be interested to know that... Uh, uh, just this year, we are actually making a CD uh, this year. Um, it's for non such, you know, which uh, uh, has this one modern composer that they have everything he's ever done. And we're doing the Dr. Atomic Symphony, so they wanted that. Oh, so John Adams. John right, Adams, right, right, right. Yeah, John Adams. Well, originally the Dr. Atomic Symphony, which was, you know, extracted from Dr. Atomic, the, the, the opera was supposed to be 40 minutes long, which they went, okay, 40 minutes, you know, is good enough because while it won't fill a disc completely, it's long enough. Well, he ended up cutting it to 20 minutes. <laughs> so, so now we're having to go back and record another one of his pieces to oh, fill okay. out the rest of the disc. Right. But uh, I, we got a copy of the agreement from the parent company of Nonsuch. It turned out that Nonsuch is owned by... I don't know who they're owned by. I, they're probably owned by somebody different this week. You know, the companies just, they they're, they sell and trade off all the time. But uh, uh, the manager of the orchestra called me in, and he read me the contract. And it was like a contract from the 90s. And I told the manager, you can make an airplane out of that contract because there's no way that we're going to do it. Yeah. You know, if I have to go back and get another vote out of the orchestra, we're not giving away those rights. Not only that, the contract doesn't allow it to be given away. Right. You write that bean counter and tell him we'll be glad to license it to him for five years, but that's it. Right. We're not giving it to him in perpetuity if hell freezes over. Yeah. So he, uh, he, uh, he called this, uh, this uh, guy at the recording company, which, as you know, now is mostly bean counters. They're not like the old uh, record right. execs who actually knew something about music. And uh, this guy was like, oh, well, 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 then we just won't do the recording. And my manager said, well, okay, it's fine with the musicians. So then apparently somebody got involved and straightened this guy out, that we weren't going to give away the rights forever. But that, that was actually a proud moment for me where I went. <laughs> I finally told, uh, 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 I think it was, you know, I don't, re I don't really know what <laughs> it's now. They've all changed so right, much that... Right. You know, I finally told him, no, we're not giving you this in perpetuity. But, you know, during that whole time, I mean, we were negotiating stuff like uh, one time the Federation came to us and said, the companies want some language about chamber music recording. And we said, what do you mean chamber? We're symphony orchestras. We're not chamber music. Well, you're classical musicians, so you've got to write this language. And we said, those chamber music groups don't want, they, they're... They disappear in the studio, and you feed them raw meat for a week, and they make a recording, and they come out. They don't want to hear from nothing about, <laughs> you know, four-hour sessions, mm. three-hour sessions. They could care less. That's not the way they do business. No, no, no. The companies have got to have. So I remember we wrote some chamber music uh, sections, and I was touched because I got a, a call from a chamber music guy who said, well, I'm glad the union has finally put a stop to those endless <laughs> sessions. <laughs> you know, so here we thought that's what they wanted to do, but no, apparently not all right. of them wanted to do right. that. But, you know, we did that, and, and, you know, we were constantly trying to figure out ways to record a, a body of the literature 
that was almost impossible to record under the old agreement because of the two-hour minimum rule. Mm. For those of your uh, people watching this that don't know what the two-hour minimum rule is, every member of a symphony orchestra gets paid the first two hours of a recording session, whether they play or not. And that was, that was kind of the outgrowth of the Philadelphia right. recording guarantee. Right. Well, the problem is then that cut off a whole body of literature like Haydn symphonies and, and the large instrumental chamber works from being recorded because you'd have to pay the whole orchestra and it just wasn't you know, monetarily uh, uh, able to do that. Uh, so then we wrote some sections of, uh, you know, that enabled us to go, go and record. It was under those. 26 people. That yeah, didn't we put all kinds of little funny rules right. in there you know, that you kind of had to know the business in order to maneuver around right. the rules, but if you knew the business, you could maneuver with the rules and get done what you did, and, and uh, uh, you know, we did that. I remember one time we came up, one time when Fred was involved, we came up with this formula for uh, trying to record uh, chamber music that was based on sessions. We said, look, if you'll agree to guarantee 10 sessions, we'll give you carte blanche. Well, they didn't want to guarantee it. Anyway, so anyway, we got into it, and <laughs> finally we came up with this formula, and the lawyer for the other side <laughs> says to Fred, do you work for the National Football League? <laughs> you know, this is, what is, this is an agreement line of sports. And we said, yeah, that's where we got yeah. it. Yeah. So we copied, uh, we actually copied uh, that out of oh, some geez. of the sports agreements. But uh, So, you know, we would do things like that. The best one we ever did in a national negotiation was with PBS. For some reason, PBS and Ixom hated each other. <laughs> I don't know why. When I think back on it now, I, 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 I don't know why, but we did. Something about PBS just rubbed us the wrong way. Anyway, we went into a negotiation one time, and PBS made such jerks out of themselves that their lawyer came over and sat with us. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what that means when a lawyer goes and sits with the opposite side. <laughs> We thought that was pretty funny, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, so we used to we used to have fun at the negotiations sometimes. So, if once upon a time orchestras actually made significant income, right. and I know the managements did, right? But certainly the musicians did um, from doing media, and we don't now. Right. What's the value in doing media for us? I think that the value we have for doing media now, besides musical reasons, like for instance, I think that the now, what Adams, do you mean by musical reasons? Well, the, the, the Adams is, is an example of musical reasons. Okay, this is a this is a very uh, prestigious American composer. You know, there's a recording company that is devoted to having the body of his work on recording, and uh, you know, I think that's a good reason to have those recordings. They are not, everybody isn't going to run out and buy a John Adams recording, as you well know. But I think, nonetheless, it's a good idea to have, uh, you know, to have, uh, to have those recordings. But the other reason is, in this day and age, is marketing. It's marketing and audience development. That's the reason to record now. Like, for instance, I, you know, we need, uh, and, and I think that we have it, but we don't have a recording of the St. Louis Symphony with our music director in St. Louis. You know, if you go into a coffee shop or you go into a bookstore, you know, in St. Louis, you'll sometimes see recordings of foreign orchestras, but not of the St. Louis Symphony. And, and we're going to make an archival recording of, you know, SLSO greatest hits, sampler recording. We're, we're probably going to do it for nothing and let the management distribute them out there and put them in every coffee house and bookstore in St. Louis, and maybe even with a little slip of paper that says, bring this to the hall and you'll get a 50% discount on your ticket, you know, that kind of stuff like that. And uh, that's what we need recordings for. We don't need, uh, you know, there is no market for classical music now. What market there exists is easily satisfied by the enormous and as you know, it is enormous. The back I mean, catalog. How now. many, yeah, catalog that's out there. How many recordings of the Beethoven Ninth do you want for crying out loud? So, uh, uh, you know, that's what we need. We need recordings now, I think, mostly for marketing, mostly for audience development. 
and and uh, you know we'll make those recordings and we'll make them out of archival recordings where it doesn't cause us any extra work. So I think that's going to be the the wave of the future. There's talk now of being of uh, somebody's come up with some software so that you can come out of a concert and buy a recording of the concert. It's uh, in San Diego that you know yeah, that San yeah, Diego yeah, software. Yeah, right. So they've come up with that and. Even though the LSO tried that and it failed miserably, I talked to the LSO and they, they, all they did was mutter about how badly it failed. But even so, I think it, again, for marketing purposes, might be worthwhile to offer that service you know, to the audience. You're looking away, around for ways to add value to symphonic concerts. It's not a lot, enough anymore to do what we've done for 100 years in this business. You know, where people come to the hall, they sit there for two hours, and they listen to the concert, and then they give a standing ovation. And then they go home. <laughs> yeah, and then they go home. I mean, that's not working too well. You know, you've got to have value added to the concert. You've got to have cocktail parties. You've got to have talks by musicians. You've got to have, you know, buy the recording. Uh, I think that's going to be the uh, things that we're, we're going to need to do to keep our audiences buying tickets for the live concert, which is really where the action is. Right. So that's, that's what I see. We need agreements that will address that area, or the orchestras are just going to do it. And uh, so we can either have agreements or the orchestras will make their own agreements. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. This is You're welcome. Interesting. Well, always glad to relive the old days. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>